Minnesota Timberwolves fans, welcome back to the Living in Loserville podcast. He's Aaron. I'm Chris. And we're here to talk some Timberwolves basketball. And generally speaking, there's like a little positive here. Or, oh, man, that was a great game there. Or, man, he's a young player showing potential. We would try to find um, some improvement, uh, not just positivities, because there were plenty throughout the year, even when we were, you know, just, well, we were tanking, right? Now people are pissed that we're tanking. No, um, we're going to discuss this stuff. Obviously, you know, we saw that uh, that March that Edwards had. In fact, the last time we did a show, because we've been doing these back-to-back Viking shows, we talked about that March and, and you know, how Edwards just exploded. And just after the All-Star break in general, how uh, the team's coming together overall. But the efficiency of Edwards, we'll talk about some of the other items besides scoring that he's doing. Obviously, D'Lo is fully returned now, whereas the last show we did, I think he had played a, just a couple of games. Of late, Vanderbilt's been playing great. Um, we're just going to kind of talk it through the positives, some of the negatives still, of course. But just the different rotations, the, the different lineups we've seen, the, the possible lineups we'll see. We'll discuss the last few games kind of in general last night. Finally, the Wolves stomped a bad team. That was quite nice. So there is a variety of stuff to talk about on this here podcast that we'll dig deep into. Uh, but if this is your first time listening to the Living Loserville podcast, welcome. It's available a lot of different places. You can stream it live on blogtalkradio.com forward slash rope it over radio. But you don't have to go to blog talk or ro- on rope it over there. You can find the platform on Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Player FM, TuneIn, a variety of other places. We're also part of the Grooming True Sports Podcast Network, which can be found in a lot of places. Why don't you head on over to thegroomingtruth.com? It's basketball, football, boxing, baseball, everything in between. And a handful of months ago, Aaron, my co-host, opened up a channel on Spricker called Living in Loserville. Some of you folks have been there. He's also got some non-sports stuff as well that you might want to check out. He started a new, he's going to start a new sports podcast as well. It's called Living in Loserville. It's on Spricker. That's the channel. And sometimes, you know, he had a bunch of pre-draft stuff. So there's a variety of stuff to check out there. And one more thing. If you're thinking about cutting the cord or you have, you're not quite happy, I got something for you. It's called AT&T TV. The plan starts as low as $69 a month. Simple pricing. No hidden fees, no annual contract. You can, of course, stream it anywhere on any device. They have the cloud DVR available. And if you sign up for the choice package, it'll give you a free year of HBO Max. That's AT&T. All right. Let's go ahead and bring in the other host of the show. Aaron, what's going on, man? How uh, How's life treating you, sir? Life is treating me well. I uh, wish we could get some 70 degree weather uh, soon because we're stuck in this like mid 60s stuff and it's like you know it's not quite where you want it but it's it's better than negative two so we'll take that and you know you did mention that we got to stomp a team last night and it's just something we're not used to seeing um, but it was so good to see that you know this is a team going in you knew you should have beat uh, and you did you beat them from you know opening tap to to the end of the game it's kind of a route. And it was really nice and refreshing to see that not only is this team like getting to a point where they can can pull games like, you know, that you don't think they're going to win out, but also they can just go ahead and take care of business like you think they should. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, maybe the, the increased efficiency of Anthony Edwards and what he's been up to lately. And it's just been a heck of a month for this kid. I mean, the last two months, it's just been ridiculous uh, for him. And I really like what I saw this last 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 month but even i mean cat and indilo the trio outscored orlando before they pull, were pulled from the game 67 to 66 um which is kind of crazy when you break it down there at half um it was the seventh biggest lead at half 30 30 point lead at half um there was a moment of 17 to 22 possessions where they scored i mean just 74 to 44 at half um and even a, there was a point when it was five minutes left of the second quarter, Magic, you know, shooting 30% weak, 
we got six blocks. I mean, it was – they were slanging it, Rubio and D'Lo and everybody else. That's something uh, we'll talk about with Ant, too. He's been passing more of late. And, uh, I mean, it got to a 40-point lead. 40 so it was uh, man almighty. And, obviously, Ant had a big game uh, a couple of games ago with 42 points. But it was the other – items that he was doing uh in general um rebounding passing not settling um the the guy it's like you tell him to do something and a couple games later he's already doing it and finch holding responsibility for everyone i I think during the press conferences aaron he said you know the great thing is nobody you know there's not closers on this unit right i mean there's closers on the unit of course but Nobody has just a right to close the game right now because we're not a winning franchise right now. So let's just see who's playing the best. And even with rebounding, how he's like, hey, I need to, I need I need eight rebounds tonight. And Edwards would be like, I got you ten, you know. But he also is talking to Edwards about, hey, dude, if you get the board, you can just go. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you know, like it's just a little mini incentive. Um, Because he really lets these guys play, just takes a couple of things from them and then says, hey, you do you, though. Um, This month, just in general, like I said, rebounding, he had, you know, I think last night he only got 16 points, but he had 10 boards. Just the all around game in April is what in in early May here is what really impresses me about this game. Well, it is. It's the overall game, like you said, and it's everywhere. You know, it's what needs to be done at what time. You know, you did mention that. You know, he said something about closers and, you know, maybe you need, you know, different guys to do different jobs and different situations require a different type of closer and and what you have and the choice of three guys. I mean, we just saw, you know, Towns destroy a team a couple nights ago. Uh, Then Edwards went off for 40 a few nights before that. And then, you know, D'Angelo came up big last night, just pushing the lead ahead and just kept it going and going. So different guys are doing different things. And uh, of those three, you know, I wasn't exactly confident in in Russell, uh, but now I'm, I, we talked a little bit off air how impressed I am with him, and yeah, maybe I hadn't seen enough of him. Uh, that's your, you know, you, you contend that that's the case, but I'm, I can't say how impressed I've been with him, and makes me regret that some of the things I said earlier. And um, as long as he keeps this up, I mean, so some of the the simple but complicated, sophisticated is the best word I guess I could use for basketball plays that I'm seeing now with him and Rubio working together. You know, Edwards coming into his own defensively and rebounding and, and just getting after it in any way possible. Now, Coach is, you know, still experimenting a little bit. He's only had him for a couple months. Um, but what you start to see with Finch is this, you know, change in philosophy that, I mean, all of us were down in the dumps when they made that coaching change. And I said, well, this guy seems to be a bit of a kind of a basketball coach stereotypically that, I, that I'm kind of used to. And lo and behold, this guy's not only changed the way we finish games, win or lose, but he's changed the way that the team plays. And that's not all him. I think Ant's got a big thing to do with the energy. But, I mean, that's really – since Anthony Edwards really started to come into his own on this team, it's it's a whole different basketball team. And I know there's a lot of things going into that, but I got to say that a lot of that has to do with Edwards. Yeah, and being healthy. And being healthy, especially we talked about, well, how's Cat and Ant and – and D'Lo going to blend in, you know, a month, in, well in a, a, about five weeks or so, it, it's it's looking pretty good. If you look at the on the floor, off the floor, uh, we'll talk about that a little later. It, it's pretty damn good. But in the month of, you know, in March, the only thing that we had to say about Edwards was the 21 shots to get to 24 points. That was the only thing it was like, eh, but, you know, we also thought, well, there's no D'Lo. So that's going to be more. And then that's when Beasley went out for 12 games, too. So obviously he was going to score more. He's going to shoot more. Um, But this month, literally a month later, yeah, okay, so he only averaged 21.6, but he's averaging five boards. His assists are up. Like you said, he's for the month he was 1.6 steals. His shooting percentage is way up from two-point range uh, driving as well. He's up to, for the month, he was up to 51.7% for the month, uh, 34, basically 35% from the three. And obviously the other night he was eight and nine from the three. And it just all around, 
the efficiency with this kid and, and, and you know, and, and literally he's got so much growth still that he, you know, that he can, he can still have, I mean, but then that game two nights ago, 42 points, six boards, seven assists, 17 at 22, rather than 31 shots on that last 42 and eight of nine from three. And what's crazy is this one, some people were like, yeah, but he only, it was kind of strange to have 42 points and he was 0 for 1 from the free throw line. He only got there once. But when you're 8 and 9 from 3, guess what? You know, you probably aren't getting the whole line a whole lot. And as a whole since the All-Star break, the Wolves have actually gotten to the line just as much as any of them. In fact, this is from Britt Robinson or Robinson. Um, since the All-Star break, this was a, a maybe like six days ago, second most attempts per game. And they were 29th prior in made in 28 attempts uh, in attempts. And so literally they're, everyone's getting the line, not just, um, you know, our guy ant, but I mean, the energy, the, the, the team is just, even when they're losing, you could tell they had a good chemistry. Everybody, people on the bench were still excited. They were still plugged in, but as much as we've seen little tweaks and minor stuff offensively, Aaron, it's actually accountability and defense that is improved under this quote unquote offensive guru guy, which kind of takes me back and go, okay, so he is just a solid head coach. He's not just the offensive guy. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, you think about Edwards, he's not getting, like you said, he had one or maybe one free throw attempt. That's going to change next season. He'll ride through probably not getting calls for the next four games, finish out the season next year. He's going to be getting calls. So that's an extra six, 10 points a night because all he does is go to the basket and God, is he good around the basket? You know, it's a different way than I've seen other players attack the basket as far as, you know, getting to the rim, but uh, he makes it work every time. Maybe Kyrie was also had the dexterity in the air of, of making, you know, layups, turning things into layups. And he's been doing that. It just blows my mind the different ways he can come across. Maybe a little floater, maybe a lean back shot there. He gets to the rim and he makes it work. So obviously he's going to get calls and he's going to get more of them because everybody knows NBA stars get calls. So I'm waiting for that to come along. So I think the refs have kind of been spreading it around a little bit, but once that starts to focus on Edwards, I mean, he's going to get calls when he goes to the rack and, and, and that's extra points. And, and that helps in the free throw slows the game down. Does a lot of the things that will help this squad and like Finch, I, I don't want to get too glowing of my praise with him. But it's starting to grow, and it, it it's hard to put your finger on exactly like you said. It's a little bit of adjustment here, a little adjustment there. But, man, Chris, overall, I just think these guys are finally having fun, you know, having fun playing basketball. That shows up on the defensive side. That shows up on the offensive side. So whatever has happened inside the locker room of this team, I think it has Edwards a lot to do with it. I think Finch is giving them freedom. He's also putting them in positions to succeed, which makes the game fun. And I think that that's really the difference, man, that you don't see a lot of sore faces anymore. Nobody's complaining. There's not – Cat's not crying about calls. He's just getting down the court. He'll say something, but he doesn't he didn't whine about it like he used to. And I think that has to do with just guys being in position to be successful, taking advantage of that. You know, one thing leads to the other, and all of a sudden that spark. You know, we talked last year a lot about that, about like, God, just, they just got to get a spark, and then everything feeds off each other. Well, I don't get too far ahead of ourselves, but – I think we've seen that spark was lit and uh, now things are starting to feed off each other. And it's so nice to see. And, you know, I watched that whole game last night against Orlando and like we had a huge lead the whole time, but it wasn't any less fun to watch. And, and it just, it's a good sign going forward. I don't really know what to say. I think Finch has something to do with it. I think Ant has something to do with it. I think winning has something to do with it. I think all of it just kind of goes together. That's how basketball teams work, man. One thing leads to another and it's all interconnected. And we can't stress enough health, you know, like we actually got the key pieces on the court, too. Um, and that's something that we just didn't get enough of, man. Um, and speaking of another quality role player who, funny enough, um, you know, earlier, um, I mean, I'm not talking about D'Lo just a second, but D'Lo said, and we talked about this off air just a second ago, he said, we haven't figured out, a, you know, a way to lose it. We don't know how to even lose yet. And, of course, you know, the context of that, people are going to, if you don't have it, 
people are going to run with it, put it on Twitter, and, oh, I hate D'Lo for it. But he was right. He was exactly right. And, you know, you grind it out all the way, even this last Miami game, even that game uh, when Towns got into fall problems, only played 26 or 24 minutes. With The game wasn't over. It wasn't, you know, we almost won the damn game. But I'm kind of adding to that with Vanderbilt. And actually, it was this press conference or maybe the press conference post game before Finch said, you know, Vanderbilt earned these minutes that he's getting in two blowouts. And those are the blowouts when we didn't have cap for those back to back games. And he literally so he's literally saying, hey, we're watching everything and we mean it. You know, we really mean it. We are. And it's not just saying it to the media. And clearly that's exactly what's happened. And if you look at, um, you know, his defensive estimated plus minus and all the analytics with Vanderbilt, you know, defensive analytics can be weird. Um, no doubt, but Dana Moore uh, actually tweeted this nine defense possessions finished for uh, Vanderbilt in the first half. He had five steals and four defensive rebounds. And literally the, the rating was like 113 and 118 him on and off the court. Vanderbilt has really, really stepped up. You know, he had his moments early. Sometimes he does have a problem catching the ball in the lane. I get all that. Um, but now we have another guy along with Rubio that can pass more. And Towns is still going to be able to pass more in this system than he already is. We've seen Edwards uh, dribble, dribble, look for something, kind of grind its way, knowing he can't get to the rack. But still, he did that twice last night where he's like, okay, 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 there's an open shot. And But Vanderbilt to me is – really i mean we talked about it a month ago or whatever three weeks ago you know we talked about two guys and he was one of them for next year because that's our two free agents and you know we all we both thought hey it'd be nice to at least have him as a reserve but man this stretch of games from the last time we did a show it's just really pushing that ahead and he's got size you know we all love mcdaniels but he can't play the four year round so to say Every get every saying seven game series, you know, he's going to have to play the three at times and at least Vanderbilt has a little meat on him. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's well said. And he's a grinder. I mean, that's your guy. He's a lunch pail guy. He's the guy that just comes in and does the dirty work and can also score a little bit, can pass a little bit, make smart plays. Um, Kind of a half court type of dude. But, you know, he's always kind of Johnny on the spot, gets a lot of bunnies. Uh, you don't obviously don't draw anything up for him, but he's there to, you know, get a rebound and a put back or, or a block here or maybe push some guy out of the way and, and get the job done. And as far as a role player goes, I mean, you can't ask. You need one of those guys. I don't know if you need six of them, but you need one of them. And you got one in Vanderbilt. And, and he just kind of seems to be Johnny on the spot a lot. And he, he's not the most coordinated guy, but like you said, he's got size. He's got length. He ain't afraid to stick his nose in there. And uh, he can get down the court. He can shoot a little bit. But mostly he's this around-the-basket type of grinder guy that you need now. Could he? Could we use a bigger guy? Yeah, possibly. But maybe he doesn't have the heart. So maybe you know he's a heart guy and he's just making his money on that right now. But um, yeah, I'm impressed with the way he's played. And he fits good with Towns. But he does, you know, he's good in that second unit. He's different than Wancho. I mean, I really like him. And if he gets a chance to come back next year, Chris, depending on – how the draft goes and, and how everything else goes. I, I don't think there's a really a question on whether or not you want him back. Um, I don't think he's going to ask for too much money. He's obviously not going to ask for too many minutes. Uh, he kind of knows his role and, and he's really good at it. Yeah. And meanwhile, you know, he was got, covering Butler for a little bit. Like he, he's not just a big that he can go out and get somebody like that too, which is just huge when you already know you're going to be talented offensively. And you also made a good point there about he could start him and McDaniels could start. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that's the starting lineup tomorrow um, or one more time someplace. But the beauty of it is Vando can, and not just Wancho, but same with Reed. You know, Nas is pretty good at defense at times. He's not that good. Hey, whatever. Wancho's is okay. But, you know, for him to be that defensive guy on that unit too – I mean, how couldn't you want him at least as a reserve, no matter what we do with the powered forward position? Or I guess you could say 
center as well, technically, because it does feel like either this year or by trade de- deadline next year that we will add another big, but it doesn't mean he can't play. That's for sure. And some people, well, McDaniels, yeah, but McDaniels is like 180 pounds, dude. I'd love him at small four. He's a starter, dude. There's, We're not saying he's not a smart starter, but, you know, it's nice to have a small lineup because you need it. In seven-game series throughout the year, you need it. Uh, foul problems, whatever. Um, you need depth anyway. And, and some of that is, you know, people are like, yeah, but what about this and what about – well, hold on. We're just not used to having ten players on our team, Aaron. <laughs> that can all give you something. You know, I remember us saying that months ago, like – we got some talent here. It's just got to be blended. But let's not worry so much because when uh, Finch first got here, Vanderbilt got the most minutes, and people were like, oh, he's in the doghouse now. Now it's the opposite way. Now, it, you know, it's just so funny. Like, I think I really think it's – I mean, people are going to, you know, be critical regardless. And people that create, you know, that are in the media, they got to do a show or write a column or whatever. You know, they need, they need material, of course, but – I think we're just not used to picking out 11 guys on a team that all can do something, have have some sort of role. That's it. I mean, we're just not used to it. Uh, have a deep bench like that. And like I said, we didn't get these guys. For, we got them, a lot of them. Uh, Nas it was what, G League? Uh, Vanderbilt was, I'm not sure if he was or not, but McLaughlin, these guys that are playing significant minutes, uh, whether it's coming off the bench uh, mostly, but they're finding roles and they're role players and, for what we got them for and what they've turned into and the way Wancho's really blossomed attitude wise. And also just what he's doing on the courts, kind of taking a, a role on that second team. Um, he, you know, Vanderbilt's just one of those guys that you build this thing, you know, you've got your three and maybe you pick up a fourth depending on how the draft goes. Um, but you've got a three players here that you can use in different spots. Now you're filling roles around them and you start to find, six to eight guys that can really fill those roles for whatever you need. I mean, you got a tough guy, you got to go against, you use Vanderbilt. You got somebody else that's a little more slick, you use Wancho. You come in with these different options to use in different nights. And like you said, you get into a seventh game, seventh game series. Well, then you're going to be moving lineups every night, you know, matching up with different teams at different times and what you want. And it's nice to have all those tools in your toolbox, so to say. And, you know, it's good to see that that's being explored. I'm not saying Saunders maybe didn't have that in mind down the road, but I think Finch really put that in and has actually said, okay, I've got a couple months here to figure out before I even implant all the things I want to do in the off season. I want to see what each guy can do in each situation. And I think really what's been most impressive about Finch is that he's done that he's experimented and what you see are fruitful gains from his experimentation and, like you said, now we're going to probably see some different lineups to see how they go together. And I'm not saying it's a throwaway year, and obviously we're not tanking, but to win and to also get experiment and to kind of get to know the players and what they can do in game situations, uh, it's been really great the last month, month and a half, and I just want to see that continue. Yeah, since the break, it's really been a different squad. We're playing right around 500 ball. Um, and he can also – lay a shimmy on you with the shoulder too. I mean, he, he can, he could be a linebacker with that shoulder. He played the other night trying to go for the ball. Hey, I was a little physical. My bad, my bad. Um, but, uh, and you know, it's funny. Saunders was almost too many tweaks. It's like, all right, dude, a Kogi at the four again. Like, you know, sometimes he was just going crazy with them. And instead of having a rotation and stick it with for five or 10 games and seeing what it did, you know, obviously he had some injuries, but, you know, to, to deal with and with no cat. And that's been the biggest thing, of course, is, is cat, especially with the offense. Um, but, yeah, man, it's 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 really coming together. And even in, you know, we talked about this, too, like even in three losses, you know, New Orleans, Memphis, Miami. You look at the New Orleans game up by nine with three minutes left. We kind of got Zion that night, you know, in the, in overtime. Uh, he, he was 14 of 17 from the field goal he's get he, he's basically doing what Shaq was doing his early years um but yet he's gonna be you know a bust what a bunch of people said and he can't hit the three okay but he doesn't take them so it doesn't matter I thought you guys didn't like this three now you got a guy come okay I gotta stop okay well we got Zion we got Zion <laughs> a little bit but even that was a winnable game you know Memphis um which they just have our number for some odd reason I think it's five or six in a row yeah 
John Morant went off, 10 assists, 37 points. And to, to credit them, they hit some key shots down the stretch. That's that big ant game where he just went off. Um, clearly in the second quarter and in the fourth quarter, we were missing cat because of foul problems. Sometimes you get maybe an early third, but then you make it a good, good ways without picking that fourth up. That wasn't the case. I think he played 26. Yeah. That's the difference in the game. I think. Exactly. I mean, sure. You can blame it on cat two or two turnovers and, and we didn't get some uh, uh, offensive rebounds, but you play cat for four to six minutes. We probably win that game. We, we got the lead when he came back in with like four minutes to play. So I think you're right. I, I really think that you can start to look at that. And then even this last one, um, heart, we showed some heart instead. You know, we grinded it at all the way to the end, you know, not having D low to close didn't help, but I liked how D low got thrown out. He was, you know, stomping for Ant. it was an N one. <laughs> it should have been a foul, but he didn't get in anybody's face. He freaking was running back, got tech. Rubio, of all people, got a tech. There were six technicals in a short amount of time, but we kept grinding. Ant had a, a rough start, had 18 points in the second half, and that's, kind of, you know, Cat and Jimmy changing, exchanging words. I just love that feistiness, and those are three losses. That was impressive. It was an impressive game. You're right, the feistiness of that game. Now, it was a strange game because I thought – the referees played a larger part than they ever should in a game. And I'm not saying any conspiracy theory here, but you know, it seemed like there was, they wanted it to go a certain way. And uh, you know, all those technicals, Rubio gets a technical for what? I don't, I didn't see what he did. Did he say something maybe? I Well, two of but... and the coach were already there and they don't want a third or fourth guy to come in. That's something that they've established a little well, bit. They make a good call for Christ's sakes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, what do you right? expect? That does you know, help. Want people complaining. I mean, even Finch was upset with this game. So, you know, Ant put in a little barb uh, in his press conference and, you know, he's not a complainer for the referees. I don't think you could do that in the league, but he let it be known. Uh, subtly what he thought about that. And again, we lose by what? Uh, nine points. Uh, that game could have went either way. And you're right. There's heart. They didn't give in uh, feistiness. They were going at people. Towns was motivated. I like Towns when he's motivated, man. I like it when he's feeling tough and he's he's got something to prove. He's always sort of been that way in his time here. But, you know, those games were few and far between. Now it seems like it's every night he's coming out with a little bit of toughness and wanting to win it. So that was a big test. And then, you know, you follow that loss up and you go down and you spank Orlando. I mean, I don't know what to say about it, except for, you know, there's four more games left of the season. And I, I just cross my fingers, man, I hope this continues because uh, what you're seeing in heart is what we're seeing, Chris. And that was always missing, I think, uh, previously uh, in the last two seasons was just heart, having fun discipline, roles, all these cliche words you use for basketball, but those are things that we're missing. And you don't, you know, maybe you didn't see them, but now that you see them, we're going to certainly know when they're missing. That's a great way to put it. We actually have a franchise record in this season with six 15 points comebacks. Um, Obviously that has been an issue. It seems like it's calming down a little bit in the last maybe six games or whatever, but we have gotten off to bad starts or whatever, but once again, in the past, to your point, you know, like a lot of times, OK, we'll just get them next week, you know, and, and, and they'd just be done and we just get our ass kicked. And, and we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're grinding more. We're grinding more in general. Um, now, early in the season when Cat was hurt um, and we did complain a little bit about I remember Beasley uh, said something like he just won't, you know, it'd be nice instead of 28 minutes, if I can get 33, he didn't say those exact thing, but that's, that was the one thing that really stood out uh, beyond just being too buddy, buddy for Ryan Saunders um, was the minutes he was playing the starters, even at least the top three starters or whatever. Um, and, and that is another thing where like, he's given most, you know, two or three or four guys starter minutes almost every night. And I think that plays into it too. Like, they're actually, you know, we, we played a lot of people earlier and some of it was injury or COVID, but we played so many and it was like, dude, nobody's playing over 30 minutes right now. Like what, what's going on? And so I think that plays into it. They're, they're just, they're happy when they expressed 
you know, something that they you can you can just see the communication out there. Um, it, it's just it's really coming together in, in general, like I said, especially from the break. And we were just scratching the surface in general. But earlier when Cat was out with the wrist injury, came back a little early. Sounds like there's still something wrong with it. He's going to have to maybe get cleaned up or something. And, you know, off of those minutes or lack thereof, um, a lot of people say, oh, we're just tanking. This is bullshit. We're tanking. And then oh, a couple of games before Cat was coming back, D'Lo went out for an extended amount of time. And and then Beasley went out for 12 games. And then D'Lo came back. And then Beasley's out for the rest of the season. Maybe he'll come back one more game or whatever. But now here we are putting together some games. And what do we hear? What do we hear? Before it was like, who cares, dude? You're only – the best percentage you got is 40%. And, and then now even the media are chiming in on some of this. Now we should be tanking. But what do, what do we say here? So we, do, we, we don't want to tank, then we do, but now we don't. So try. So we were supposed to get beat by Orlando last night, I guess. I, I can't believe it personally. I mean, you've got a young team here. We off the air kind of illustrated uh, to ourselves how young this team is. And they're starting to make huge strides, uh, whether you want to admit it or not. Just some of the things we've outlined in this show. Uh, Tell us about some of the strides this team is making. You've got, you got them on a roll. Are they winning every game? No, but they're in these games. They're beating bad teams. They're competitive with good teams. They're figuring it out. And you want to go ahead and say for the sake of a, a, a possible chance at a draft pick to get these guys to lose games? It just doesn't make any sense to me. They're learning how to win. They're learning how to lose. They're learning how to play. They're having fun. And you want to tell these guys to start tanking? so that you can possibly get a shot at a, a player that you may or may not need at this point. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And anyone who's, who's telling me, maybe back in those days, in the dark days, Chris, like you said about, you know, Cat's out, you know, Russell's out, and Beasley's out. Yeah. You want to talk to me about tanking then? Okay, possibly. We can talk about it. But now when you're somewhat on a roll, and I'll, again, be conservative with that. We're not on the best roll ever, you know, but. There are things that we're seeing, and that's all you and I have ever wanted to see. Yes. There are signs. And if you watch this game long enough, you can see these signs. It is preposterous to even even to use the word tank in their presence. It's ridiculous, Chris. That's the way I feel about it anyway. Yeah, and, you know, not long ago we were number one and number two kind of lingering in there. And obviously the top three spots are 401 then it drops down to 36.1. We could be in a position here in the sixth spot where we're 27.6. But remember that fourth and fifth spot, which you could at least go, it's about a five-man draft or whatever where uh, there could be a difference maker. But Golden State still only has a 9.6 chance of even getting those if we if we end up in the sixth spot. So it's really funky how that works. Um, and remember, now we're starting to hear, oh, you know, it was a mistake to, to add that first round pick, but then they hated Wiggins and he was untradeable. So then when we trade him, now we have proof. We went from one to six, like in a month, <laughs> a month and a half. So you telling me we couldn't have got to eighth or 10th or 12th or whatever. Let's just say 10, let's say nine. Are we really going to be super bummed about the ninth pink that we didn't get on a, this many people under 25 and 22 and all that and 20. I mean, that's another thing. The fit d and we're going to talk about him, to, you know, in the last little part here, as well as some ant audio, by the way. We can't forget about that. But um, it's just so funny. Like, the fit is much better, especially now that we got Edwards. And let's not forget, we did get the first-round pick last year that we won in the lottery. How many times? We won it one time before, right, with the uh, with, uh, cat, right? And because people say Wiggins, but no, that's not true because we didn't draft him one. And it's just uh, it's just funny how that 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 turns around. And, it, and so I can't look now and say, oh, I blame Rosas that this is even a problem. Well, had we have even had had D'Lo played 12 more games, had Cat played 16 more games, that would have done it. That would have done it. We wouldn't even been in this spot. So it's just it is. And not only that, but we got a guy that we drafted last year 
you know, that, that were, that's chilling and doing well, like you mentioned. So it's, you know, you can't win for losing sometimes. No. Nah, and you know, Chris, you're, you're hearing stories like, you know, uh, Wancho and Ricky and, and Ant are going to go to Spain in the off season. You know, they're, they're riding on a high mark here, man. And it just doesn't make any sense. And that's why it's hard to even kind of, you know, justify it with any of our words is to like, yes, it's been bad here, people. And yes, it would be great to get a top three player. But then you think about it, you've got three tops, you're building role players, you're, you're, you're fostering something here that looks to be going in a winning direction. And you got guys talking about what they're going to do in the off season, everything that good teams do are starting to be built here. And you want to turn around and, you know, tell us to, to throw the last 10 games at a, a pie in the sky. What's the saying, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Well, you know, you know, tanking and then expecting this draft pick that may or may not happen. That's, that's, you know, that's two in the bush. Let's keep the, the bird in the hand and move forward and get to this off season and maybe enter next season with an incredible amount of legitimate and valid optimism. Yes, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So, um, you know, delo has been back now for about five weeks, give or take. Um, when him and Cat play in the same game, they're 11 and 9. Uh, the last seven games, he has 9.1 assists. Now, he had that 14 and 12, so that skews the stuff. But it's in a month, so we can say that to any stat. But um, he, he's definitely added with Rubio to be another passer. We talked about Ant's improvement. We already knew that Cat could pass, but in this system, he's going to ca- you know, pass a lot more because we're going to run it through him. Um, you know, they brought him off the bench at the start. They recently just put him in the starting lineup. I love him uh, off the bench. What's that? I love I love Russell off the bench. So you don't think he should be a starter? Uh, I like him both ways, but I, I really love what he adds off the bench. I I don't have a favorite. I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he shouldn't start or he should be off the bench. I just t- saying I love him off the bench. I love what he does when he comes into a game, assesses it, figures out what's missing, what needs to be done, and gets it done. I love that. Yeah, my thing is which was pretty evident. We talked about it, not on the last show because we didn't do a Timberwolves show for a while, but we talked about this off air before we were doing the Viking show is the start still, you know, and the, the second unit, him, uh, you know, Wancho and Reed were getting them back into the games and sometimes taking the lead, but then you got to take them out because you can't play them the whole second quarter. You got to, you know, so um, the fact that he can do it, it makes it versatile. And we'll talk a little, I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff in April anyway, off D-Lo like we did Ant, but there might be a way we can do a little both. But if you look at the bench scoring, 20 points uh, he did in April, and that is the highest scoring off the bench since 1996. Look at these names. Tracy Murray, 98. Ricky Davis for Boston uh, was 18.2. That was 2005. Nate Robinson, J.R. Smith, 1999 six, six man because he was getting older. Latrell Sprewell, too. I love that list. Not just because D'Lo, but because of all those names. I like a lot of those uh, guys. But, I mean, when you look at his play in this month and even of late, um, if you look at efficiency, you know, if you shoot at least 14 points or um, 14 times a game, the only guy that was leading him in April – was Steph Curry. I've heard he's pretty good. I've, I've heard that. I don't know yeah, if that's true. Um, <laughs> when we talk about clutch, and that's, you know, he's a clutch player. People may not like the guy personally. Maybe he takes an extra shot or two too much. I get it. The volume shoot. Yeah, great. That's what scorers do, though. Um, he won't be the first guy. I mean, look around the league. But when you talk about closing in efficiency, if you look over the last three years, in 2019, he was fifth, um, fourth last year. This year, he's eighth. Um, the guy gets it done in the closing time. And when Ed gets there, and I call him Ed sometimes, by the way, Edwards, instead of just Ant. But when he gets that three that you know is coming, it's not just going to be streaky. It's not just going to His favorite player is Durant. So a tall dude that can shoot, he, he it's not going to be streaky. I can tell you that. It's going to be money. But when though, I mean, to have him and 
end cat down the stretch of games, we just touched and scratched the surface of what this squad is going to be. But I do. So they started him off the bench and they would play him, you know, as these starts to the game got better. Even that's the, that's one of the best defensive lineups we were starting. No doubt about it. But the problem was we weren't d up sometimes in the first five to eight minutes. And and sometimes we definitely were, but we couldn't ever separate ourselves barely because that is a when you got a Kogi and Rubio on the floor, that is a tough shooting thing. And you need shooters in today's NBA league. Um, and so but I still liked it and we still got a lot out of it. And he was still getting in there with three or five or six minutes left. Sometimes, you know, in some of these games, he got it in, a, you know, three, four minutes into the game. Uh, matters how the starting unit went. Either a Kogi would go or Rubio would go. So he blended in nicely. Now he's in the starting lineup. But, you know, much like Edwards did when Beasley and Rubio were go- – or not Rubio, Beasley and D'Lo were out, they had him in Edwards playing early in second quarters and early in fourth quarters and have to take that little mini break around the nine or eight-minute mark. Well, we could start them like they had the last couple games, but if you notice, they've been taking them out like – five, four, three minute mark putting in Rubio or last night, you know, McDaniels wasn't there either of uh, the last two games actually, but we could still get them with that unit, you know, and just take them out a little earlier. Um, so I think no matter what, it's going to blend. And a lot of people, you know, the problem with Rubio not starting, I get it. Cause we talked about that, how he can't, um, he can't play the shooting guard, really. He needs to be the point guard, and that takes away J-Mac. So I understand that, but I think people are kind of forgetting, and they say, well, he's not a shooter, so that unit's going to be different. I hear you, but when you give Rubio, remember, Beasley can be a six-man. We've talked about that all year, that he, he can do that too. So when you give him Beasley, Nas, and Wancho, and Noel, I mean – That's pretty good shooters for Rubio to pass the ball to. (laughs) So you're telling me he can't if if I just my thing is, if 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 D'Lo can run the second unit, why can't Rubio, especially when a shooter comes back in Beasley? You know what I mean? I, I think he can. Some people are doubting it. Uh, I think you laid it out pretty well there. I mean, in fact, I could I could see that in my head. I was going to ask you earlier about. What you thought Beasley, how he, how you thought Beasley would fit in uh, when he returns, and you know I, I really like what you thought it out there. I, I like that you know you can you can use D'Angelo, start him, uh, and put Ricky in a spot with his age and everything that I think he really thought he'd be doing when he came here. He's worked a lot this year, and um, you know so he, he, Beasley off the bench to score, Rubio to, to run the, the second team of of good shooters and guys that run the floor really well. I mean, you really probably will get out and run with that lineup a little bit if you're talking about yeah. Rubio, Beasley, Vanderbilt, possibly, you know, McDaniel. Even a Kogi, maybe, too. He might be part of that. Kogi, he likes to run. Nas, you know, those guys. I feel like you could get out and run a little bit, which is what where Ricky really shines, mm. is in, yes. you know, running the ball. And so that's really good, man. I think you laid it out great. And, and you did kind of answer my question there with what we're going to do with Beasley. I can sort of see that working out because sort of, you know, confused a little bit as so okay well now you got you know russell's working good with rubio and ants working in there with both of them and, and mclaughlin's looking really good for what he does and uh what's beasley gonna do you know where, where's a spot for him and he's kind of laid it out really well so uh you know i can see that he's you know instant offense off the second team as far as three-point shooting as far as uh, he might not be the greatest defender but he's not terrible at it so you really see like maybe a running bench is kind of nice for having like a stagnant cat lineup and then come off the bench running with Rubio. That, that's really good, man. I, I just can't, you know, I couldn't see it, but now I do. And we've seen how some analytics is still with Rubio and, and D'Lo. I don't think we have enough time with it anyway with a lot of this stuff. But um, no, you're not going to play them all the time. But the fact that they can play together. <laughs> And that's what the media was really pushing against, that there's no way they'll be able to. Well, they've done pretty good. But if you look at another one they were talking about is D'Lo and Edwards. You know, D'Lo's going to take away shots from from Edwards. Well, look at this through April. Um, 
on court, off court. So, of course, off the court, D'Lo off the court, Edwards on and without him. You know, he's going to average more points. He's averaging 12 points. He's also taking 11 shots. He's shooting 36% from the field and actually in April, 30% from the free or from the three point line, taking five shots a game, five and a half. Now with him on the court, D'Lo and Edwards, sure. You know, the points go down from 12 to nine. The shots go down from 11 to six, but he's shooting 50% from the field. He's taking uh, two and a half less threes, but he's hitting that 38% from three. So, and D'Lo broke it down pretty nice last night. And the post press are saying, dude, we all, like, I can't get to the rack like that. I mean, he's got slow feet, dude. It's clear. You can see it from a mile away. That's why I like his, some of his craftiness. But, yeah, he's not going to get to the rack unless it's a high rebound and all that. I mean, he could get to the rack, like, cutting and all that and off the dribble once in a while. But he's nothing like Ant, you know. And, it, but, okay, fine, you know. Now Ant is actually, now he is drawing attention, Cat in D'Lo or just D'Lo or just Cat. And then now Edwards is taking a three where he's in position. It's not all step back threes. It's not at the end of the shot clock. He's right there ready to go pull up wide open. And same with, I mean, I've seen D'Lo open sometimes. I'm like, you're really going to, okay, dude, he's going to throw it up. There you go. You should have guarded him. Like, and, and that's what we're seeing. And we're just, we're just scratching the surface. Like these guys barely know each other on the court, but yeah, man, it's uh, Delos fit in really, really good. And the fact that he did it in both, you know, starting so far, in, you're with the starting unit and um, the bench, just tells you he can blend in. And this system, much like Cat, this system is he's going to thrive under this system. And you can already see how excited he is, along with the other players. Like you said, the the spirit, the vibe is there. Even when they lose, they knew they know exactly what they do. And next thing you know, they're rebounding harder the next game. Yeah, well, before we get to the sound bites, um, I just kind of had a thought to my, I was thinking about, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we're going to mesh all these guys together and what's going on. But, you know, knock on wood in a playoff situ- situation, um, that's a problem for the other team. You know, right. It's that's a matchup nightmares. And we're trying to, you know, put the do the math in our head on our own squad. But imagine being the opposing team in a playoff situation trying to do that math. You know, any guy gets hot that night. You got him like Beasley can come in and drop 30 on you. Right. You're down by 17. Okay, put Beasley in the lineup. Okay, cool. Now what are you going to do? All of a sudden, you know, Russell can mess around and, and drop 29, 30 on anybody on any night, depending on how they play him. And obviously we know not only can he get your bigs in foul trouble, but he can also step back, hit threes. He can go off for 40, 30 any night, and Cat can dominate in the post and do the same thing. These are matchup nightmares. So while we sit here doing math of how we're going to get guys minutes, how we're going to you know, mesh these guys together, let's think about it from the opponent's uh, perspective on, on how you match up. How do you match up on a night-to-night basis in, let's say, a seven-game series? It's all looking like if things go the way they should, that it's just going to be – I mean, you got little pieces you can use just to come out in situations. Let's say you're going up against, you know, your third night against the Lakers, and you know, and 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 LeBron's getting the best of you, which he probably will. You know, you're going to need instant offense. You're going to need points. There's guys on the squad now that can drop, you know, a 20 point quarter on you like it's nothing. Beasley, Russell, Ant, these guys can do that. Cat can hold you in like in scoring in the half court. It's, it's all good news. There's no such thing as tank. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're also seeing, because of what Ed Edwards is doing and what, what D'Lo draws the attention, you're seeing more and a way more aggressive uh, cat now. I mean, how many throwdowns? And same with Nas Reed, dude. How many throwdowns does Nas Reed? He's a, I feel bad for the rim sometimes. Like, I'm like, damn, I, we should talk to make sure that rim's okay. Mental health is a serious thing. I'm just kidding out there. But seriously, like, I mean, it, it's looking good. And then let's let's have a playoff push to get uh, knock at the door. And then you can re- then you go in a seven game series and you get probably exploited at some point. Right. Of course. And then you go, OK, what do we need now? Or you get 50 games into next year. OK, what do we do? Should we do a trade? Whether we do a trade for a big man. You know, in the off season, at the trade deadline, whatever, after um, the season next year, it, it, it's just all positive, like you said. And, and 
you know, for some of these young players not to get the time that they had, you know, in the summer league even. I mean, imagine Edwards in the summer league, dude. That would have been <laughs> fun to watch, dude. But to have a full month of camp and all that, it just uh, – it's working, man, and, and you know we did say at the halfway point we want whether it's wins or losses we want to see improvement, and I'd have to say, in some ways I've been surprised on the wins and some of the defense, uh, for large chunks of games, not the full game just yet. I've been surprised on all of it, Chris. I mean I'm not gonna say any uh, anything but that. I'm surprised by the wins. I'm surprised by the improvement. I didn't even expect the things that I'm seeing now to be happening. I thought maybe we'd pull a few games up. Edwards would kind of still be learning. Uh, but we're almost to this point at the end of the season here, and knock on wood, but he's starting to take games. He's starting to take guys. He's starting to know where he's supposed to be. He's starting to know his place in the league. He's starting to know about all these things, and it's all subtle. And he's just confident out there draining threes at a much better rate. Uh, he's knocking down shots. He goes to the to hoop better than just about anybody I've seen in a long time. That same efficiency and movement, and you and I have been holding back a lot on our praise for Edwards, you know, because we want to see things over time. But uh, I can't really hold back now with four games left in the season. It, Even defensively, it's yeah, arc, I mean, he it's was lost of this earlier year. in the season off the ball. Not so much as now. No, he knows the spot. He gets to his spot. He hits it. Just the arc of like, okay, we got this young buck coming in. Let's see how he plays. Oh, he's got potential. All of a sudden, potential went to, oh, my God, what the hell was that? To the next step to, oh, my God, he figured that out. And now we are here after a 40-point game, consistent great scoring game, still not getting calls. That's 10 extra points a game he's going to have when he starts getting calls. I mean, well, I don't I, know I'm, about I'm, that. I'm going to pump some, the brakes here. I don't know here. about 10 points, but. Some of it he wasn't going to the rack, he was settling. But you're right, those extra couple of falls a game, man, they add up. <laughs> Within the game, foul problems, like you mentioned, getting the bigs in foul problems, that's a big freaking thing. Yeah, and it's just, you know, like I said, I'm going to pump the brakes here because I get a little excited, but there's a lot to get excited about, man. And if this kid continues to improve, his, his, his next step is – a top – I don't want to say it. We'll just knock on wood. He already words. said it. In the let's just keep – let's just uh, – yeah, but now I'm worried about saying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This so is the Timberwolves. <laughs> and, dude, he's six days younger or whatever than the Kate Cunningham, the, you, you, you know, consensus number one pick. He's younger than that guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So, So here it is. Because he knows, like everybody knows, Wancho and, um, you know, Ricky, they, they, they're they in Spain. That's what they do. You know, they're done. Um, they don't they don't hang out here much. A lot of people still come back in August to play in L.A., in Miami. You kind of got to play in L.A. and Miami with other pros uh, in the summers. It just helps you out. But um, obviously you can work on your own game with your own personal trainers nowadays way more. And you get like a core of guys that you work out with. And obviously they have that core over in Spain because – they're all buddies. They got a team over there. You know, they, they've been together since they're teens and shit. So it's, that's why they go there. Um, but a lot of fo a lot of these players are going to stay longer than they would or spend longer time frames here in Minnesota working too, which is dope as hell. Obviously, Cat was even talking about it last night, how he needs to clean up his wrist or something's up with his wrist, but he'll be okay. But um, Ant said last night or the night before, like, I'm going to Spain this summer. They did kind of – it was kind of funny. On Twitter, people took that quote the wrong way. Like, dude, he can't be there all summer. It's like, dude, calm down, man. Why don't you listen to the interview, dude? He didn't say he's going to spend all summer there. Like, calm down. He wants to go to Spain. Leave the kid alone. Uh, but this is what he had to say about uh, visiting <laughs> his boys uh, over in Spain. It was, it was classic ant. So – how do you feel when you know that uh, you have a growing number of fans in, in other countries? And uh, what would you like people from abroad to know about Anthony Edwards? Uh, I really want to visit uh, wherever Ricky and Wancho is from uh, because I do want to learn how to speak Spanish, like fluent Spanish. Uh, so when I get a chance, I'm definitely going to go over there with them because I'm pretty sure they over there all the time in all season. So I'm definitely going to go over there with them. And I want to 
meet a lot of people. I want to sit and talk, and I want to, you know, learn Spanish. So I feel like my fans over there, I, I really love you guys because, I mean, it's nothing like having fans across the country that you really don't know about. So that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So Juancho and Ricky are not teaching you any Spanish right now? Even I mean, bits, bits and pieces, but I want to, you know what I'm saying, when they be talking, I want to be able to understand them and speak it and be able to have a, a fluent conversation with them in Spanish. So I feel like it's going to take for me to go over there on a little trip for an extended amount of time, you know, learn some language. So maybe next time we can do this in Spanish. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> and that's just, I, I mean, it. that just sums them up, dude. That just sums up this kid, dude. And the the amount of things that have happened to this kid at a, in a the, short amount of time, I, I just can't believe he's this spirited. Well, here's the thing. Oh. Ricky, Ricky and Wacho aren't dumb, all right? And I'm not going to get all political here, but a 19-year-old kid with the world ahead of him, I can't think of a better place for him to go during the summer and time off is, is Spain and Europe. Yeah. I mean, this country's got its issues. Screw that. You got a place to go. Go learn a language. There's nothing better than that. Go learn that. Travel you know? the world. Travel. You know? Take. You're going to need time off to rest your body anyway. You know. Yeah, and they got great basketball in Spain, so he's not going to be missing out. Oh, he's yeah. Be playing he's with old Spanish vets. Or something sitting on the couch, you know. Oh, these are old Spanish vets. These are guys that have been playing for a long time. They're good dudes. I. I can't think of a better place for him to spend the offseason. If he wants to spend the whole offseason there, I got zero problem with that. Well, I, I don't disagree. think anybody should. I, told, I would disagree with that. And he even said, I'm going to take a vacation. You're not going to spend the whole time there. No way, because you got to play with pros here. you got to play with pros here. Dude. Trust me, L.A. and Miami is a spot to be for a little bit. Well, I'm much more worried about him in L.A. and Miami than I am in Spain. Right, but, you know – he doesn't have some kind of track record of getting in trouble. I'm just no, saying trouble can you find gotta you, take you know? on you gotta go against Harden in the offseason. You gotta go against the top NBA players. They've already invited him into this little special bunch where they play five on five. You gotta take on John Wall. You gotta take on the top players in the league. Because guess who you're gonna be going against? That's my point. But fuck yeah, dude. Why not go to Spain? I've heard it's beautiful. You've been there. Yeah, it's great. And it, the place where Ricky lives in Catalan, I don't know if that's where they're going to be, but that's even more better. That's like the uh, – it's a great place. And if he wants to go there, like you, you say you got to play wall, you got to play these – you don't – I mean, we, well, that's a topic for another show, and I think that's a great talker we could get into. Do you have to play these guys? Do, do you, maybe you're at a level – I don't know. That's a def, that's an Everybody interesting thing it, that dude. I'd like Everybody to Everybody in the NBA in the top 50 play each other in the summer. It's just a – I'm not saying you got to be in Miami the whole summer. That's not what I'm saying. But you do have to go against the top players because that's how you get better as a young player, not as a vet. As a young player, this is crucial. Yeah, I mean, it could be. Uh, but like I said, if he stays in Spain the whole time, I'm not going to be that upset about it. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. Getting the experience with some of these guys is a good thing to do. But also, you know um, – and also just the, the cognitive advantage of learning a language and, and being in, immersed in that's it. That's what I think. That's, that's going to help him too. And whether he masters it or not, just to be able to communicate. He obviously wants to communicate with those two guys. He sees something there that, that he's missing out on. And, you know, it can only help him. And it, it'll have a great time. Spain is great, man. If you haven't been there, I suggest you go. It's it's warm. It's nice. The food's great. The wine's great. The history's good. It's a great place. Good for him. And I hope that he does that. And I hope that uh, it means something to him because I think that's a it's a great idea. I think for your first off season to spend it with a couple of vets like that in, in a place where you could learn something. Plus, dude, he's been basketball, basketball, basketball his whole life right now, and football too, of course. <laughs> you know, oh, man, take a couple of weeks off and just chill, dude. All right. Any last words there before we shut this puppy down? No, I thought it was a fun show. Follow us on Living in Loserville at Instagram, also on the Spricker page under the same title. And uh, I'm starting a new show called It's Just Sports. Here in the next week, it's going to be local, national, whatever kind of piques my attention at the time. So definitely tune in and check that out on the Living in Loserville Spricker page. Perfect. And we'll be back next Monday. And it'll be basically a wrap-up of the season because there's a week left. It's done on Saturday or Sunday. 
So we'll have one more show left. And just as a reminder, we're going to do two of those shows, Chris Carter and Denny Green, two separate episodes of those classic rewinds that you guys love. So we'll be back the next probably three to four, uh, somewhere in that realm, uh, Mondays. Peace.